So for this first play, I'm going to be checking out Afterburner 3 for the Sega CD. Um, the Sega CD is kind of an interesting story for me. I, um, I got the Sega CD probably, uh, I think it was Christmas 1993, if I recall. And um, it was a kind of a mixed bag, to be honest, in, in hindsight. I was um, in a small town, and um, there weren't really any video stores that rented Sega CD games. And I really, I mean, as a kid, you really don't have the resources to, to constantly buy $50 games. So even though I, I got the Sega CD for Christmas... I really never got a lot of games afterwards for the system, and my library, I think, was probably maybe four to five games uh, over the lifetime that I had my Sega CD. It was kind of an underwhelming system for me, um, and I think uh, some of the, the, the reason for that were, were just looking back, a lot of the, the Sega CD games were, were mostly Genesis games with uh, CD soundtracks, and uh, so many of them were lazy ports, and... Sega CD kind of was, in my opinion, uh, the Atari Jaguar of uh, the Sega lineup. You know, uh, so many were, of the games were, were just the lazy ports where they just added CD music. And, um, you know, the, the Jaguars had the same knock where so many of the games were just lazy 16-bit ports. Um, and the hardware was capable of so much more. But most people were just using that uh, Motorola 68K inside the Jaguar just to port over Genesis games, or Atari ST games, or Amiga games, and it was it was just a, a, a sea of laziness, and Sega CD had some gems, don't get me wrong, but um, I never really experienced any of them, because uh, I kind of relied on loaning and borrowing my game cartridges. Uh, I, I, I played a lot more Sega Genesis as a result, because, you know, I knew like 10, 15 kids in high school had Sega Genesis, so we were constantly swapping cartridges and borrowing and loaning and um, just had a lot more experience using that system so this is interesting I mean I'm, I'm jumping into Afterburner now and you gotta love the Sega CD they are always showing off these um, full motion videos of um, you know basically showing off the, the F-14 Tomcat so it's kinda kinda cool that um, they were kinda being like the top gun of video games you know they they I think Afterburner was a popular arcade hit just because it came out right around the time that um, the Top Gun movie came out. So, um, you know, Sega's timing was perfect. And the arcade machine was amazing. I mean, um, I remember they had the sit-down arcade and, you know, the the seat would rotate and, you know, you would have, um, you know, the, the vibration in the, the stick and the, the throttle controls and... Um, if I recall, that's the one that had the, the red lock-on uh, warning light above the, the screen of the arcade machine. So there was a lot of interesting innovations on that particular arcade box. And, you know, just jumping into this for the first time, and I gotta tell you, the, the initial impressions are pretty good. Um, I was always kind of disappointed with Afterburner for the Sega Genesis. I don't know, it just just didn't have the gameplay for me. I, it, it was okay, but I always thought it was kind of a, a, a mediocre effort. And I think they're they're really right in the ship on this one because the Sega CD um, was a huge uh, upgrade for the Genesis in that um, thanks to the Sega CD add-on, uh, the Genesis could now scale and rotate their games. Well, at least if you're playing the Sega CD versions of those games, and they were constantly showing off the the scaling and rotating, and and you know you really showed it off in this particular game. I mean the the graphics on this uh, were pretty mind blowing when it came out. I. I do remember seeing this at the Electronics Boutique where I shopped, but uh, the one day that um, I had the choice of Sega CD games, I almost bought this, but I ended up buying Batman Returns, and I, I don't think I regret that decision. Um, Batman Returns was one of the better titles on the Sega CD. Uh, those uh, Batmobile driving levels are really good, uh, but... Uh, you know, this is this is a really great arcade port. I mean, I'm not gonna lie that um, you know my console gaming was mostly uh, Sega and uh, Atari in this time period. I, I I actually had an Atari and Atari Jaguar um, because I bought them basically at the end of life. I think it was like mid 1995 when they were clearancing uh, those game consoles out, and um, uh, I'm basically. Uh, comparing it to the Atari Jaguar because there was a game on the Jag CD called uh, Blue Lightning 
and Blue Lightning looks and plays a lot like this, although I still think I prefer Blue Lightning to uh, Afterburner because the, the problem with Afterburner is it's just an arcade game, and the gameplay is shallow in that um, I Blue Lightning was nice. You had the save feature, and you would go on these campaigns. So the missions played a lot alike. You know, I you can tell Blue Lightning was probably inspired by this Afterburner game on the Sega CD because the graphics are so similar. But um, uh, the replayability on Blue Lightning was better, even though a lot of the magazines panned it at the time. Um, having all those missions to go on, and um, you know, the different countries and. You had a choice of airplanes, too, that this game doesn't seem to have. I think it's just the F-14 Tomcat in here. Whereas, I remember I used to love to take out, like, the the, the A-10 Thunderbolt 2. And um, I think the, the F-16 is in that game, too. And there, were, there, were, there, were, there was a choice of planes on that game. So, people really liked bashing Atari. But if you're into these type of games, whether it be Afterburner or, or Blue Lightning, you know, they all kind of have that same arcade action and you know I like I said I appreciated that arcade feel but um, having those those campaigns just gave the game an edge to me and, and you know I do really enjoy Blue Lightning. Uh, Afterburner this is this is a great game though I mean this is a, 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 a great port of the arcade version uh, I think the graphics are very consistent with the arcade and um, this is a remarkable achievement um, running on a Sega Genesis because, you know, the Sega Genesis limitations were starting to show by 92 when the Sega CD came out, and the Sega CD was basically trying to extend life to it. But I, I think the Sega CD and the 32X did more harm than good, and I think that's why Sega kind of um, collapsed because they just they kept introducing new platforms, and they just had too many platforms by 95, and they couldn't figure out what to support anymore because you know they came out with the Sega Nomad late in 95 but you know then they that basically made the Game Gear obsolete so do they support the Game Gear and they were keeping the, the uh, Master System alive in Europe and those are mostly ports to the, the Game Gear and uh, then they had the Genesis to support 32X to support the Sega CD support and they came out with the Saturn on top of it and just too many platforms and I know that's what killed Sega, is people didn't even know what to buy anymore because um, they had just, you know, basically flooded the market with all these different incompatible game consoles. And hell, you could even get 32X versions of Sega CD games. That's how mad and crazy they were. They actually had Sega, a couple Sega CD games that were made to run with the 32X attachment. Um, and it was ridiculous. It was, it was absolutely ridiculous. It was just another platform to... Um, support and they just they they confused you know all the all the big Sega fans and, and I I was completely frustrated you know I had the the Sega CD back as a kid but I never never got um, into the 32X at least as a kid I have one now the thing that I also learned about the Sega CD is I I was not a huge fan of the early CD game consoles because I remember my Sega CD I had the model one the one that um with the big clunky thing that bolted onto the bottom of the Genesis. You know, the side load ones were a lot more reliable. Mine was constantly flaking out, and, um, you know, I always had the, the blinking red light of debt, and it would never function. So that's why I don't have a lot of experience with a lot of Sega CD games, because, you know, I was always struggling to get the thing to power up properly, and then um, I, I couldn't afford the games. Nobody else had the Sega CD in my town, so I couldn't swap games. And, um, yeah, I never had a library, so it's kind of nice now that I get a chance to go back and revisit some of these games. And I'll tell you, I, I missed out on this one. This is, Afterburner is, is, is a really great game. I mean, this is a hell of a lot of fun. I'm going to play it through it a couple times. I mean, it, it gets hard. I mean, it, the, the difficulty level is cranking up as I get into, like, stage 7, stage 8. You know, this, this, one thing I'll point out, too, is when you get to this, I think it's, it looks like stage 5, when you're basically, you know, dive bombing tanks and everything, that screams Blue Lightning. I know Atari basically liberated a lot of the gameplay from this particular version of Afterburner for Blue Lightning because some of these missions feel identical to what they put in Blue Lightning. And Blue Lightning was, uh, that was I think that was in late '94 release, and this game came out in 
like a year and a half earlier so it, it makes sense that Atari you know lifted the idea for um, their game from Afterburner 3 it definitely feels and the, even the way they uh, scale and rotate the sprites it looks just like blue lightning so although I you know uh, I think the Afterburner soundtrack is a little more iconic um, these are you know upgraded tunes from the arcade and the arcade had a great a great amount of music I mean I still think out of all my Sega arcade games I think the, the Outrun had the, the most memorable soundtrack there's Splash Wave and Magical you know Sound Shower and you just those those songs are so iconic but um, I might not be able to name the music in Afterburner but um, some of those tracks are, are just incredible um, just a great experience for for playing um you know a shooter uh one of the things you probably noticed too is this particular game you can actually select in the option screen whether you want the chase view which is what i prefer you can see you know the the, the whole aircraft and from behind this game also offers cockpit view and i'm just not a fan of cockpit view games in general so i always play the chase view i i same thing, you know, I, I, I've always been kind of a third-person shooter fan versus a first-person shooter. I definitely enjoy uh, games like Gears of War a lot more than um, Doom, for example. Although, you know, every now and then I can go for some Doom, too. So, But uh, something about the chase view. I've played so many racing games over the years, and it was always the same thing for that. I, I played a little bit of Test Drive and, you know, dealt with the view of uh, from behind the dashboard but I much prefer games where you can see from behind the car I just like having the, the larger field of view you know um, when I when I go out with my camera I use a bunch of ultra wide angles I'm not a big fan of, of the, the tight focal lengths um, so um, at least I'm consistent in that regard I just I just like to be able to see everything at once so this particular game is um, kind of like a, a hidden gem of the Sega CD because nobody really talks about Afterburner anymore on the um, the Sega CD, and, and I think this is the better version. I mean, I've played this on the 32X, and you know, I think they were a little over the top with all the scaling and rotating and how the the, the plane kind of zooms in to frame with the the scaling and rotation effect, but um, they were getting kind of carried away trying to show off. The, the, the technical prowess of the Sega CD, but I, I kind of like it. You know, it, it may be uh, overkill to, to show it, and, and they didn't do it nearly as much in the 32X version. But the 32X version is probably even closer to uh, the Super Scalar arcade original. So that one's probably the most arcade accurate, but um, I'm going to give the edge to this one. Uh, there's something about these cool cutscenes um, and. Um, all the ridiculous amount of scaling and rotating and I just I think this is my favorite version of Afterburner to be honest um, I did like the the version of Afterburner that came out on the Commodore Amiga although I, I I think the music might still have the edge on the Amiga even though those were on floppy disks and this was a CD based sa sound system but um, eh, I, I, that's probably a coin toss I think the, the Amiga was known for its music too so they both are probably on on par with each other. I don't think either one probably has a huge advantage for for music and sound. Um, but this is this is a really incredible experience. I um, I'm really uh, having a, a great time with uh, this particular game, and I regret not buying it as a kid. I think I might have um, might have preferred this to uh, Batman Returns. You know, Batman Returns is a great game, but it's hard as hell. And it's frustrating. Um, I love driving as the Batmobile, but it's hard to even get past that first stage with the Batmobile to even get to the platforming parts of Batman Returns. I mean, that game is just... I don't know what it was about Sega in the mid-90s, but some of those games, they just set the difficulty way too hard. And um, the Batman games are notorious for ridiculous uh, difficulty. You know, the... the uh, Adventures of Batman and Robin were absolutely that game is ridiculously hard. I don't know what they were thinking with that game That's probably the hardest Genesis game that I can think of off the top of my head um, I don't know why Batman games are so hard, but um, You know, they, they just 
wanted to crank them up for some reason. And, and I think that that's probably why Nintendo succeeded and, you know, Sega failed. I mean, it was, it was the, the mess of all the different game consoles for one reason. But I think Sega games tended to be harder and more difficult than their Super Nintendo counterparts. And because of that, they alienated a lot of younger gamers. Uh, some of the games are just so hard and frustrating that um, uh, I, I couldn't tell you how many times I threw my Sega Genesis gamepad at the ground because the games are just ridiculously hard. And, uh, um, there are some games that I think are just straight futile and, you know, or I, they don't get a lot of play out of me because they just they made the games so frustrating that um, they lose their, their fun factor. Um, but uh, thankfully... Afterburner isn't one of those games. This game is a hell of a lot of fun. I'm in, really enjoying myself with this particular game. Um, I'm advancing pretty well. And uh, for somebody who never played it before, I mean, I, I grew up playing it in the arcade. This is really good. Um, I remember being heavily disappointed with the Sega Master System version of Afterburner. I, I didn't like that one at all. Although, I don't think there's any 8-bit version of um, Afterburner I ever liked. I, I've hated pretty much anything that was on the 8-bit platforms. Uh, Afterburner was definitely better uh, as a 16-bit game. There's, um, I remember really liking the Amiga version. Um, I was a big fan. I think they it came out on the, the PC Engine. I believe it came out on the PC Engine because I remember that one being pretty good. And, you know, the 32-bit versions are great, too. Like, you know, like I said, the Sega's 32X had a great version of Afterburner. Uh, but, um... I'm coming back to this one as my favorite one. I think this is the best I've played. Uh, the the nice thing about this one is I've noticed this on a lot of games I've played lately that some of these Sega CD games, they just play so fast and, and you get the sense of speed on this one. And some of the other out the, some of the other afterburners that I didn't like um, were kind of sluggish by comparison and, and I think that's probably why I hate all the 8-bit games is the, the frame rate is so low on the Sega Master System version. And the, I think it came out on the NES as well. And obviously the Commodore 64, I didn't think the, the Afterburner game on that was a, very good at all. But, you know, again, Commodore 64 is an antique that came out in 1982, so it couldn't do um, a, a super scalar arcade game uh, effectively. So um, I cut that one some slack. I just think... Um, the Master System probably could have handled this game if they spent more time developing it. Um, I get the vibe that that was a rush job just because, again, I don't think that one plays particularly well. Um, this is this is a really great game, though. I mean, and, and man, that soundtrack is, is remarkable. It's so much fun. So, uh, if you are trying to get into Sega CD games and you're just starting a new library, then Afterburner probably should be one of your first purchases because this is um, such a great arcade translation this is really really good and um, if I had to if I was doing a, a traditional review for this game I'd probably give it a 7 to 8 out of 10 yeah, probably somewhere in the middle maybe maybe like a, a 7.5 out of 10 because this is this is a solid thing I'm taking you know points off for the fact that it's just an arcade game and there's not much depth to this game. I don't think there's a lot of replayability because, you know, if you beat the game, it's all in one sitting and that's it. You know, um, you can play for higher score next time, but, you know, once you complete this game, there's nothing else. It's just one long mission and that's the game. So the controls on this game are pretty straightforward. You've got your Gatlin gun, your missile launcher, and the third button is for afterburners. And you'll notice that I use the afterburners to try to escape. Uh, the missile launches towards me, but uh, it's not the most effective thing. Sometimes you'll try to do uh, a roll away from the missile, and the missile will hit you anyways. So that's the biggest frustration for this particular game, is you try to dodge the missiles as best you can, but you know, you're know you never going to be successful all the time. That's pretty much all my thoughts on this particular first play for Afterburner. Um, thanks again for watching another video here on the channel. Uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, please like and subscribe, it really helps out. Feel free to comment on any of these videos, and don't be shy about uh, requesting specific video games that you want me to cover. Uh, thanks again for watching.